Don't you love seeing families like that? You need to be reminded of what a family is. You see all this garbage today. Homosexual marriages, that's not a marriage. That's not a family. That's family. Get your Bible, turn the book of uh, Job chapter 19 with me tonight, please. Job chapter 19 and verse number 22. Job 19, 22. Why do you persecute me as God that are not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Bless your holy word, Lord, your holy word. Amen. There was a woman who came to the Lord one time, and she said, My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. She was a Syrophoenician woman. He said, it's not right to take the crumbs or the bread from the children's table and give it to dogs. That was a horrible rebuke. But it taught you something about the mind of God also. It shows you the wisdom of God. Because she persisted. That issue of persistence is, makes a big difference with God. You know the importunate woman who came and she wore him out and he said, if I don't let her, if I don't, get a, if I don't do something for this woman, she's going to wear me out. And, uh, and of course, here's the issue. God will never turn away a shaking, believing, cl clutching, grasping hand. You see, uh, she could not appeal to him as the son of David. She couldn't appeal to him as the Savior of Israel. Fact is, she couldn't even appeal to him as the Goel or the kinsman redeemer. She couldn't do it. So he told her plainly, he said, it's not meat to take the food of the children, give it to dogs. When he told his disciples to go forth and preach the word of God, he said, go not in the way of the Gentiles, nor into the land of the Samaritans. Do not go, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that immediately poses a dispensational problem. When he said something like that, it forces us to say, well, what in the world's going on here? Obviously, for a time, he only ministered to the Jew. This is why the Apostle Paul said he was a minister of the circumcision. And Paul was a minister of the uncircumcision when he came to do his work. So here's the reason I'm bringing this up for you this, uh, tonight. And that is because the, the, the wisdom of God that I've been talking about for some time now, the mind of God, sometimes will present you with something that's uh, insurmountable, unexplainable, makes no sense. And there appears, there appears to be no way in the world that you could ever receive anything from God. If the Lord told you that uh, he only deals with the lost sheep of the house of Israel and that you were a dog, how many of you would turn, tuck, tail, and run? Yeah. Think about that for a moment tonight. Well, now we go back to 1900 B.C. This is the time of Abraham. Yeah. 1900 B.C. There is no tabernacle. There is obviously no temple. There is no priesthood. The only priesthood we have at this time is Melchizedek. He was the king priest of Jerusalem, Salem, Shalom. So we have here with Job an ancient knowledge of God, something that uh, you have to read in the text to begin to understand what's going on. But there's a great amount of truth to be found here. A Goel is a kinsman redeemer, or he's the nearest of kin. This is found throughout all the Old Testament. So many times the word translated redeemer, redeemer, redeemer is from the Hebrew word Goel. And this is a, the nearest of kin. It's one who has the, uh, the right to intervene on, the ha on behalf of a kinsman. Now when we look at this, we, get to, we start thinking about, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came 2,000 years ago, he became our kinsman redeemer because he was incarnate, God incarnate in flesh. And when he became God incarnate in flesh, that gave him a right to confront Satan in a way that he'd never confronted him before. Because now he could confront him as a man, and being our kinsman, then he could confront him as the kinsman redeemer. 
And one of the things that he confronted him with was the power of the enemy, the spiritual power that the enemy held over us. He did hold a lot of power. The scripture says throughout all the Old Testament that the fear of death, the fear of death, the fear of death. In the book of Hebrews, he even brings it down to that place, the fear of death, the fear of death. But the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, oh, grave, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Paul said to part, to depart, to depart and be with Christ, which is far greater. I have a desire, he said. There's no fear of death with Paul. The apostle Peter said, God hath showed me how I must shortly put off this my tabernacle. No fear of death with Peter. But you see, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he redeemed us from the power of the enemy in a spiritual sense and also from the power of the grave. Jeremiah 31 verse 11 says, For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. This is a type of Satan. He's a strong man. And we don't have the power to break the bonds of Satan. But he does. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 54 says this, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So our kinsman redeemer delivered us from the power of death and the grave. Not only that, but our kinsman redeemer, having the right, uh, having the right being our kinsman redeemer, being, being our blood relative and that's very important to understand a blood relative the Lord Jesus Christ was our blood relative he is of the same blood so that gave him the right to uh, to uh, to do for us as it says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil he had the legal right to confront Satan because he was of the same blood as us. He was a man. This is not the case beforehand. For the blood of God is the blood that ran through the veins of the Lord Jesus Christ when God was incarnate in flesh. Amen. And so he had the legal right to confront Satan. Now there's also the issue of the Goel or the kinsman redeemer to buy back, buy back what had been taken away. And one of the most beautiful pictures of that in the book of Ruth, for we know that when Naomi went and her husband Ahimelech and, um, and Malon and Chilion went on down into Moab, they lost everything they had. I mean, she lost her two sons and her husband came back and she was destitute. And they call, says, this Naomi? She says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, for God hath dealt uh, roughly with me. And of course, Naomi means pleasant. It's a beautiful name. It means pleasant, but Mara means bitter. You remember the waters of Marah? They were bitter. And she was bitter, of course, when she came back. But there's a Boaz. And there's always a Boaz. And for the Boaz is able to give back unto, unto Naomi what had been lost through, uh, through, through the wear and tear of this life and through, and through the power of the enemy. And that's what he did. Now, we have an inheritance, and he got it back for us. And you say, what is that? Well, here's what it says in the book of 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Amen. Yeah. So he came to win back, to give back that inheritance that is ours as the children of God, which is in heaven. And that cannot be taken from us. Now Job, when he begins to think about these things, well, he's saying, no, wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute. <laughs> this is 1,900 B.C. How could Job be thinking about something like that? Let's look, see. In the book of Job, chapter number 9, verse 32, look at this with me tonight. Now, if you remember the scripture we just read, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Let me go back and read that for you again. Job 19.25. Now watch this carefully. Job says, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. He said, I know that my Goel, that's what he's saying, my Goel, my near kinsman. He said, I know that my Redeemer, he's going to redeem me, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. In plain words, he said, there's going to come a day when it will be made right what has been made wrong. Job might not have understood all of the issues involved. He certainly wasn't there when Satan appeared before God. But he knew some things. These are consistent, universal things of man's relationship 
God's relationship with man yeah. doesn't change. And so he said, For though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. This is a resurrection. He said, I'm coming up. He said, Whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Now look at Job chapter number 9, verse 32. Look at this issue here with the kinsman. Job 9, verse 32. For he's not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Now watch the wording. Neither is there any days man betwixt us that might lay his hand upon his, us both. Verse 34, let him take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. A day's man is a mediator. Job said that I need a mediator. You are my so-called friends, and you're doing nothing but accusing me. Job says, I know there's a devil. I know there is. I know there's a Satan, and I know he's my enemy. And so look at me. I'm in. Look at me. I am. I am in. I'm in sackcloth and ashes. I'm in pitiful shape. Is there anyone that can plead my case to God? In other words, mediate between the two of us. Is there anyone that can do that? This is what Job cried for one thousand nine hundred years before Christ. Here's what the New Testament says: First Timothy chapter number two and verse five. There is one God. And one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. What is a mediator? A mediator is one who sits down or stands and brings two opposing parties together. Somehow or another on some ground, some basis, some law, some rule, some agreement. He mediates and he brings them together. There is one God and one mediator between God and men. Now, I don't have time for it and don't have all the scriptures down here tonight. But for your own edification, why don't you do this when you get home? Look up the word peace, where it talks about Christ as our peace. Look at that word peace. Most applications to that has to do with, oh, I have the peace of God. I, I feel the peace. So that's all wonderful, but that's not really what we're talking about. What do you mean, preacher? I mean that the Apostle Paul is saying God is at peace with us. We have a mediator that's going to bring us to peace with him. That's what he's talking about. We're the offending party. We're the rebellious party. We're the ones who refuse to come under the, to come under the power of the glory and, and, the, and the honor of God. It's us. For God the Father has already extended an olive branch. He hath made peace, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is important. I hear so much preaching from, from, uh, from, from a young man especially. They'll get up and they'll, and they'll read an Old Testament scripture that says, God is angry with the wicked every day. He was. Until he was in Christ. Reconciling the world into himself. And hath committed to us. The word of reconciliation. Be ye reconciled to God. That's where we are now. See? And if you, if you don't, if you got to understand this, if you, if you approach this from the wrong attitude and the wrong perspective, you're going to have God with a club beating you to death every day and all you can do is run from Him. And folks, if God was out to get you, you'd have been God a long time ago. <laughs> I know I would have. <laughs> you're not going to outrun Him. He's not angry with me. He settled me at the cross at Calvary. I'm the one that's angry at God. That means I am the one that needs to drop my rebellion and accept that peace that he's given to us. Now, how did I do it? I did it for the peacemaker. Once you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, he's the peacemaker. He's the mediator. He can take hold of God the Father in one hand and take hold of you in the other. Yeah. He's the mediator. Amen. Job says, I need a mediator. Yes. Then in the book of Job, chapter 16, verse 19. Look at 16, 19. Let's start reading with Job, chapter number 16, verse 18. O earth, Job chapter 16, verse 18. O earth, cover not thou my blood, 
and let my cry have no place. Here's what he just said. He said, I'm crying and I'm bleeding and don't hide it. See, I'm a real person. I'm a real human being. I'm a, I'm a sinner and I need to be understood. I need to be seen. You need to know I'm here. And so don't let me get caught up in the crowd. Don't let it just swallow me up. And here's what he said, verse 19. And now behold, my witness is in heaven, and my record is on high. Verse 20. My friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleadeth for his neighbor. There's your advocate. See, the advocate. Now you say, well, the advocate and the mediator is the same. No, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. The mediator brings two parties together over an issue, settles the issue, gets it settled. All right? God's already done his part. God has offered it. He, he's in Christ reconciling the world into himself. In the book of Romans, he even says it again. But now what you have here is an advocate. Now look what the Apostle John said in 1 John 2.1. 1 John 2.1. Yeah. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate of the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. There's our Goel. There's our kinsman redeemer again. Job said, oh, that one might plead my case. Yeah. Job was a spiritual man. Yes, he, was. he understood that to have a relationship with God, there's got to be an intermediary. Yeah. There's got to be an advocate. Now yeah. he's talking about a witness. Look at this witness in verse number 19, Job 16, verse 19. And now behold, my witness is in heaven. Now there's a couple of ways you can look at that. Witness number one, he could say that this is a book. This is a book in heaven that has all of my deeds recorded in it. This is the way I've lived my life. All right? So if I'm going to be judged, Job says, then there's that witness in heaven as to who I am. Up until this point, here's the witness. But on the other hand, it could be, and I have a tendency to believe it this way, that the Lord Jesus Christ is our witness. Because you see, once you take him, you're justified before God. Amen. That's a witness. You can't be condemned if you've been justified. <laughs> you may be guilty. Amen. That's right. True. Yeah. You may be guilty. But to be justified means, I know you're guilty. But here I'm a higher authority. No payment. It's out the window. And how, did, how did it get thrown out the window? Grace threw it out the window. <laughs> I had an aunt named Grace. Grace is a beautiful name. Grace threw it out the window. Thank God. The love of God and the mercy of God. Job said, I have a witness. And he did. He had a witness. Remember now, Job is mentioned in the Old Testament as being one of the three that on his own righteousness that he couldn't, uh, God would not hold back his judgment on the people. Job. Here he is in verse 9, in uh, chapter 16, verse number 21. Look at this. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God yes. as a man pleadeth for his neighbor. Pleading for us. We have an advocate with the Father. We have a high priest seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Father justifies us because of the pleading of his Son. His, the pleading started, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. To die. it is finished. So the sacrifice, the atonement was made at the cross at Calvary. And the Bible said he shall smell, see the travail of his soul. And he shall be satisfied. God's the only one that can look into the soul. And he was satisfied. Now I want you to look at another one here. Job chapter 17 verse number 3. Here we are with the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. In Job 17.3, he calls, watch this, Lay down now, Job 17.3, Lay down now, put me in a surety with thee. Who is he that will strike hands with me? What is that? Well, if you buy a house and you put a down payment on it, what have you done? Earnest money. That's earnest money, that's a surety. Yes. That's a surety. In other words, you've given something 
that shows that you are honoring and you are into and you are responsible for your part in this agreement. Right. He hath given us the Holy Ghost. What's the Holy Spirit to us? Yeah, thank you, Lord. What? What's he called? The earnest of our inheritance, right? Yeah. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Now, I went for 27 years and didn't have a clue. Is the Holy Spirit just a word to me till he moved in? And then once he moved in, hallelujah to God, it's never been the same. That's the earnest of our inheritance. Earnest means what? Down payment. It is the down payment. It is God's surety. The, the, the transaction will take place because of the validity of the surety that has been made. In other words, it's in heaven, it's settled, it's finished, it's the witness, and it's a surety. Now, I don't know what it'd be. What would be in heaven that would be absolutely insurmountable, that cannot be passed away, that cannot be put aside? What is it in heaven that gives us access to the Father? The what? The blood. We have a new and living way, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. By his blood we enter in. All right, so that blood is a surety. That's our part that we receive, that we say we know that we have a legal binding agreement with God. Here's the surety of it. Yeah. And that's a wonderful thing. He's made a surety of a better testament. Look at Hebrews 7, verse 22. By so much was Jesus, Hebrews 7, 22. You ever notice how Hebrews and Job go back and forth? You ever notice that? You ever notice that? Hebrews 7 verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a what? A surety of a better testament. See that? When I accept the Son of God and His blood, He is my surety. God will never reject Him. He rejected Him one time at the cross. And the Lord cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He did that because He'd been made sin for us who knew no sin. It was at that moment that he was cursed that Paul talks about in the book of Galatians. Cursed is every one that hangeth upon a tree. But the Lord Jesus Christ never lost his faith in God. His trust in the Father. Never. And he pressed through everything that he endured on the cross. Trusting in the nature, the faithfulness, the word, the character of God. You can read that in the book of Isaiah. And God raised him from the dead. Yeah. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Yeah. He was made a surety of a better testament. The Bedouins have an institution of the Goel, a kinsman representative, still exist for the avenging of wrong done to a kinsman. This is an ancient custom that goes back. Many of the things in the Bible you'll find among the people, the customs of the people around it. Because it passes out into it. A vendetta is when something has been done, bloodshed, something happens, and you go back and you make them pay for that. That's a vendetta. The word came from Corsica, an island out there that's a kind of an odd situation where it's not them alone, but in many places, even to this day, you go murder somebody and they'll come after you. They'll come after you. I'm not advocating tonight vigil vigilante justice. I'm not advocating that. But sometimes, you know, the justice system fails you. It does that. It'll, it can fail you. There's no question about that. In the case of Abraham, when they took Lot, you remember that? Yeah. All right. There was no sheriff. There was no government. No. There was no, there was no, was no uh, court of law or law... Uh, uh, officials enforcement so he took 318 of his own servants 318 he went to war right. and he got locked back he did that because he was the kinsman redeemer 2nd Samuel chapter 13 verse 22 I'll close with this tonight I want you to think long and hard what I'm about to read to you 2nd Samuel 13 verse 22 and Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Now here's what you have with Absalom and Amnon. They both have the same father. 
They both have the same father, but different mothers. All right? That was one of David's problems. When you multiply wives, you get into all kinds of trouble. And David had wives and he had concubines. And there are all kinds of problems going on in his home. <laughs> a lot of people say that this right here is a direct product of where Nathan said to him, the sword would not depart from your house. And I don't doubt that. The sword stayed in his home. But look at chapter 13, verse 28. Absalom hated Amnon for what he had done to his sister. Now if you read into the text, you'll see what he did to his sister. 2 Samuel 13, verse 28. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. And when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you. Be courageous, be valiant. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man got him to his mule and fled. This is retribution. This is retribution because Absalom's sister had been raped and then he kicked her out. First he said he loved her, but it wasn't love. But Absalom loved his sister and he made him pay for what he did. What is this? This is the kinsman redeemer. He's the father. He in the, take, acting as the male there present with his sister. And so he did that. Now the Bible says when Christ arose from the dead, he destroyed him that had the power of death, even the devil. The Lord Jesus came into this world and he faced the devil, not as God, but as a man. Yeah. That's important. You know, any times I've said to you, any time, if the Lord Jesus had wanted to, didn't he say I could call 12 legions of angels? Right. Well, certainly he could have. As the second person of the Trinity, he never gave up his innate deity, his power, but he never used it. But he could have. He's still the Son of God. He's God manifest in the flesh, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Lord Jesus is God walking amongst us. He could have wiped Satan into oblivion in a heartbeat. Said the word, Satan would cease to exist. But no, he didn't do that. He met him on his own terms because Satan is the God of this world. Face to face, eyeball to eyeball. What do you mean God of the world? Because he has a legal right to the kingdom of heaven on this earth. Satan has it and has always had it since Adam gave it up. And Adam gave it up when he sinned. And so when the Lord Jesus showed up, he had to have a legal right to take from Satan what Satan had power over. And that power was death. So how did he do it? He died. And when he arose the third day, he broke the power of death. Right. You can't, he, he won't, no, he's already, right. the death has done everything death can do to him. Death is finished. So he arose from the dead. And the, when he arose from the dead, every one of us that are born again tonight, we're in Christ. Yeah. Spiritually and symbolically, we rose from the death. Amen. From the dead. And so we live anew in Christ. He broke the power of Satan. Folks, if you're a Christian tonight, Satan has an awful lot that he can say to you and bluff you. Because about 95% of everything Satan can do to you is nothing but a bluff. That's right. yeah. He has no real power over you. No. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. If you plead the blood covenant with Jesus Christ, that's the foundation for everything else you do. If you got your feet firmly planted, your spiritual feet firmly planted on the blood covenant, then you are standing on something that Satan cannot cross. He cannot cross that line of blood. Because that's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can deal with Satan. A lot of different ways to do that. I want to close with this one from Genesis 16, verse number 5. Genesis 16, 5. It's always intrigued me <clears throat> what Sarah said to Abraham. At this time it's Sarai and Abram. Genesis chapter 16, verse 5. Look at this thing closely now with me. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. Do you see that? The Lord judge between me and thee. <clears throat> Lord judge between you and me. 
and each one of us. We're all accountable to God. We're all accountable to the Lord. I wish we'd live our lives thinking about the fact that every thought, every word, every deed, everything about our life is naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It is. You can't hide anything from the Lord. You know, don't rely upon some prayer you prayed a long time ago. You know what I'm going to tell you tonight? Look for the fruit of the Spirit. Look for the fruit of the Spirit. Well, I'm trying. You don't have to try. An apple tree doesn't have to try to have apples. Just because it's alive, it'll have apples. All right? Peach tree, if it's living, it'll have peaches. See you know what I mean? Therefore, if you're living with the life of Christ in you, you will have the fruit of the Spirit. Now, you can quench the Spirit. You can grieve the Spirit. Sure you can. But that's the acid test. The fruit. You judge a tree. You judge a tree by the profession it makes. It says it's an apple tree, but it doesn't have any apples on it. What's wrong with you, tree? You're messed up. What are you, a fig tree? No. You judge a tree by what? The fruit it bears. All right, so what kind of fruit are you bearing? What kind of fruit am I bearing? That's important, folks. That's important. Because we've got an awful lot of people in Baptist Church just bad as the rest of them. They're counting and depending on something that happened to them a long time ago, and their life is as empty and dead as it can be. You want, to be close, you, want the, you want the Lord's Holy Spirit working in your life and through you. And that's really the only thing that will touch somebody else, too. It will be your Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. I'll say this, and I'll, I'll say this tonight. The Holy Ghost is one powerful being. Because he's God. He's God. Father, bless your word. Bless your holy word. And this time we have together, Lord, as brothers and sisters, Father, to fellowship together and fellowship around the cross and around our Lord Jesus Christ. As we stand on the blood covenant, Father, we know our enemy. We know what he's trying to do to us. But we have all the things that Job cried out for. We have them all in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's everything we need. He's completely and fully satisfying for the soul of a man, the Lord Jesus. We need not look anywhere else. He's all we need. In Jesus' name I pray. And amen. Amen. God bless you, folks. God bless you.